Good morning. Uh, First scripture reading is uh, Matthew 25, verses 1 through 13. At that time, the kingdom of heaven will be taken like ten virgins who who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. The foolish ones took their lamps but did not take any oil with them. The wise, however, took oil in jars along with their lamps. The bridegroom was a long time in coming and they all became drowsy and fell asleep. At midnight, the cry rang out, Here's the bridegroom, come out to meet him. Then all the virgins woke up and trimmed their lamps. The foolish ones said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, our lamps are going out. No, they replied, there may not be enough for both of us and you. Instead, go to those who sell oil and buy some for yourselves. But while they were on their way to buy the oil, the bridegroom arrived. The virgins who were ready went in with him to the wedding banquet, and the door was shut. Later the others also came. Sir, sir, they said, open the door for us. But he replied, I tell you the truth, I don't know you. Therefore, keep watch, because you do not know the day or the hour. This morning's second scripture reading back to the Old Testament. From the book of 1 Samuel, the 16th chapter, the first 11 verses. And if you're using a red church Bible, that starts on page 276. Again, 1 Samuel chapter 16, the first 11 verses, starting on page 276. The Lord said to Samuel, How long will you mourn for Saul, since I've rejected him as king over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and be on your way. I am sending you to Jesse of Bethlehem. I have chosen one of his sons to be king. But Samuel said, how can I go? If Saul hears about it, he'll kill me. The Lord said, take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord and I will show you what to do. You are to anoint for me the one I indicate. Samuel did what the Lord said. When he arrived at Bethlehem, the elders of the town trembled when they met him. They asked, do you come in peace? Samuel replied, yes, in peace. I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Consecrate yourselves and come to the sacrifice with me. Then he consecrated Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. When they arrived, Samuel saw Eliab and thought, surely the Lord's anointed hand stands here before the Lord. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at things that people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Then Jesse called Abinadab and had him pass in front of Samuel. But Samuel said, the Lord has not chosen this one either. Jesse then had Shammah pass by, but Samuel said, nor has the Lord chosen this one. Jesse had seven of his sons pass before Samuel, but Samuel said to him, the Lord has not chosen these. So he asked Jesse, are these all the sons you have? There is still the youngest, Jesse answered. He's tending the sheep. Samuel said, send for him. We will not sit down until he arrives. May the Lord add the blessing to the reading of his word. Thanks, Dave. Let's have a word of prayer. Uh, Heavenly Father, I pray that you would speak to our hearts. This morning we give you this time. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So folks, um, 1 Samuel um, chapter 16. This is the account where Samuel is sent to Bethlehem 
to the house of Jesse to seek a successor for Saul. And we didn't read the whole chapter because I believe God's leading me to come back into this uh, the next week and perhaps the following, not really sure. Uh, but I want you to place this passage uh, somewhat in its context with me. This is a really huge and important account in the life of the nation. Uh, we've got stuff going on in our nation right now. We've got an upcoming election. You know, they always say that every election is, you know, could determine the direction of the country, and it's generally probably true, right? Saul has failed. God wants a successor. This is a huge and important time in the life of the nation. Now, let me give you a little bit of a backdrop here. To You probably know the scripture, but I want to refresh your memory. Recall Saul. He was head and shoulders above everyone else in all of Israel. Uh, he, he was ultimately the people's choice, so to speak. The people wanted a king. And when they asked for a king, by de facto, what they did was they rejected God as their king. So God gave them Saul. And God gave them everything that comes with a human king. Right? Failure. So Saul was the people's choice. And if you take a look at Saul's kingship, it kind of really reflects what the people chose. They chose to reject God, and as you take a look at Saul's decisions in his kingship, one after the other, he's rejecting God. It's kind of, uh, you know, it's kind of like almost, uh, you know, he's the, he's the banner, the poster child for him, right? And so what we have here is a king that starts to pile up victories on the battlefield, and yet, he starts to pile up failures, too. And so, 1 Samuel 16 is about God's choice. Finding a man that would be after God's own heart. And if you stop and think about it, when David, David is the gold standard for all the other kings that would come in the northern or the southern tribes, all the other kings in the Old Testament, David is that gold standard, right? A man after his own heart, God's own heart. And yet, you take a look at David, human through and through. He failed too, right? So, that's the emphasis of 1 Samuel 16. But I want to take you into something that I think is... Uh, very relevant for our time and for this morning. I want, to take, I want to direct your attention to Samuel and his mindset in verses 1 and 2. Samuel was mourning for Saul. And as I look at this, Samuel was not mentally and emotionally in a very good place. You ever have those moments where you just kind of frazzled? You're not mentally and emotionally in a good place. I mean, some days, you know, some days it's like, you know, popcorn off a battleship. And other days it's like you just feel, I don't know, frenzied, you know, frayed at the edges, right? Samuel is not in a good place. And God comes to him and he says to him, how long are you going to mourn for Saul since I rejected him from being king. Fill your horn with oil and go. Now what I see here, folks, is this. A whole lot of emotions getting in the way of what God wanted Saul to be. And I see that as an application here this morning. You know, a whole lot of emotions come into our life and heart daily. And sometimes they get into the way, in the, in the way of where God wants us to go and be. Amen? It's true. Now let me give you a little history uh, about um, Saul. You'll recall in 1 Samuel 13, 
he got impatient and he sacrificed before Samuel showed up, right? Samuel says in that chapter, verse 14, that your kingdom would not last because he was disobedient. And then in 1 Samuel 15, Saul is told to attack the Amalekites, conduct holy war, kill everything and take nothing. And what does he do when you read the account? He brings back the king of the Amalekites and he took all the best spoils, the stuff that you could really use for around your farm and all that stuff, right? And if you read the account in 1 Samuel 15, he says, oh, I sinned. I didn't know any better. And then you read a little bit further. He goes, well, I was really fearful of the people. Emotions, right? Emotions got the better of Saul uh, and, and, and it got in the way of doing what God told him to do. And, and that's what I see here, folks. It's easy to let emotions get in the way of what God calls us to do. Samuel did the same thing. His emotions got the better of him. He let his feelings dictate the situation. It's hard. It's really hard. And, 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 and what seems to be the case here is that Samuel mourned excessively for Saul. Now, I recall, when, when, remember when Joseph died and they carried his bones back to Egypt? They, they mourned for 40 days. And I don't really know. Uh, David mourned for seven days. Uh, you know, and I don't know what the, the, the gold standard here is for mourning. But Saul was excessive. Way, way, and it could have been months. I mean months. Because we have chapter division here. But if you take a look at the end of chapter 15. After... After Saul had sinned uh, and not and taking the spoils of war, Samuel finally, like they went and they worshipped, but then Sam, Saul, Samuel went to his own place. He had no contact with Saul after that. In other words, he was done. He went, he went back to his hometown of Ramah. And, and so the question is, how long? Uh, we really don't know. Scripture doesn't tell us. God said it was too long. That's probably good enough to, for us to understand. And so I look at this passage and I, I, I think of what Solomon said in Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 4. There is a time to mourn, right? And there is a time to weep. Uh, it has its place. It's appropriate. It's necessary. It's therapeutic. That when we don't deal with our emotions and mourn or grieve or go through what we need to go through, we bottle it up and it makes us sick. So there's a time to mourn and yet there's also a time to fill the horn with oil and get up and go. Amen? It's true. Uh, you know, emotions get the better of us. You know, we get disappointed. We experience grief. We get down. We don't move on. Heartache and heartbreak keeps us from being what God wants us to be. We keep on going back. We keep looking back. God never intended for us to look back, folks. From the time he called, never intended us to look back. Always look forward. That Despite you know, falling into the pit. And, you know, I, I look at this, I say emotions and feelings can be problematic to doing the right thing. I've seen it personally. I've seen it within my family. I've seen it within the church family. It's hard. It's hard. And, and you know, here's the other thing I see here too. You've got grief. Lost, the sense of loss, right? Now, grief can be, you know, usually we think of grief in the sense of losing a loved one. But grief can be any sense of loss. Uh, you can be grieving when you're losing your health. Or if you go bankrupt, you can grieve. It's a loss. But you couple that with fear? That's a pretty toxic 
emotional cocktail. You bundle them together. I mean, you don't need to bundle them. Grief is bad enough on its own, and so is fear. And yet, it's thoroughly human through and through. That's what we are. We're human. We mourn. We grieve. We get paralyzed. And, and we can't, for whatever reason, jump the rut. We get in this groove, and we just make a deeper and deeper and deeper groove, and we can't jump the rut. Samuel was no different. Here's a great man of God. He loved the Lord. He knew the scriptures. He gave his whole life to God in service, right? And he was no different. He had feelings. He was not robotic. He had bonds of affection. He ministered to God's people his whole life. From the time he was a little kid, his mother put him into the service, right? And he cut his teeth in very, very difficult times. When he was old enough, he became the circuit rider. He went all throughout Israel, town to town, met the elders, engaged the people, sacrificed, taught them. He was invested from the time he was, like I say, a little kid, right? He saw the tragedy of Eli's family. You know, Eli's family, he, he was the priest and he didn't do real well with his kids. And God judged him for that. Samuel saw that tragedy. He saw the tragedy of the nation when the ark was taken by the Philistines. He probably saw thousands of dead Phil uh, uh, Israelites lying on the battlefield. I mean, this, is, this guy's not impervious to emotions, right? No stranger to hardship. And yet, Samuel's down. He's depressed. He's fearful. He's grieving. And he can't get out of it. He's advanced in years. Uh, I think it's chapter 12 where he talks about a farewell. He gives a farewell to a speech to Israel. And um, now you got your king. <laughs> and I told you what's going to happen, right? But he's, he's older now and he's getting tired. But you know, I, 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 I think that he had some bonds emotional bonds that were really forged over the years. As I said, elders, town to town. And then what about Saul? Saul is, is, is the first king he's ever anointed, you know, hoping that he would be the last. Gifts of great grace were bestowed upon Saul. The tide in Israel was turning against its enemies. And yet, all of a sudden, Saul turns his back. You know, have you, ever, have you ever put so much time and energy into something only to have it blow up and you're just like, oh man, I don't want to start over. I don't want to do this again. I'm tired. I'm, I'm done, right? I think that was Samuel. He put so much in only to see Saul turn his back on God and the people. It went from a blessing to a curse. Listen to, listen to what one scholar, John Woodhouse, in his commentary, 1 Samuel, looking for a leader. This is what he says. Quote, the great prophet Samuel, and make no mistake, he was a great prophet, was not unaffected by the calamity over which he presided. We may reasonably assume that he developed an affection for Saul. Saul would suffer from his failure, and Samuel wept. More than that, Samuel cared deeply for God's people. Remember how he said to, him, to them, Far be it from me that I should sin against the Lord by ceasing to pray for you. Woodhouse goes on to write, Israel would suffer as a result of Saul's failure, and Samuel wept. More even than that, Samuel knew that Saul's failure was a failure of faithfulness to the Lord who had done such great things for his people, unquote. So Samuel wept. I think, as I look at this passage, 
Samuel took Saul's departure pretty hard. Be no different than, you know, you see a fam family member who knows the Lord and they just start screwing up and walk walking away. Break your heart, right? Uh, we, we have this great man of God in a great state of mourning. I think it's a great picture of the heart of God toward his people. How long he mourned, we're not sure. He no longer had contact, but what a sad state of affairs. He's concerned for Saul. He's concerned for the nation. What's all this going to come to? And not only that, he's concerned for his life. Take a look at verse 2. What, is, what does this tell us about Saul and the environment? Samuel's concerned that if he gets up and he goes to Bethlehem, that Saul's going to put him to death. The Spirit of God has already left Saul. He's acting erratic, irrational, you know, mental. He's concerned. And, and, and it's almost as if he's moved beyond being sensitive and loving and caring. Not that he lost those qualities, but he moved from that state of heart and mind and disposition in, into anger and depression. If you take a look at uh, chapter 15, Saul was, uh, uh, Samuel was angry with Saul. A righteous anger. I oftentimes wonder if maybe some of that anger wasn't redirected back toward God. It's like, you had me do all this, and this happens. Excess, excessive sorrow and grief just dominates his mindset. Have you ever been there? Yeah. And it, human weakness rears its ugly head, and Samuel surrenders to it. And he goes... Like Jonah, he goes down and down and down and down. And he can't get out. Um, one scholar said he was smitten with fear. I mean, it just dominated his life. I one time, I one time met a uh, Christian woman at a Bible study. A wonderful saint, but just so pathetic. Um, fear just dominated everything she did. She couldn't even cross a bridge without being concerned about it falling down. That's a pretty bad state to be in. You know, I look at this passage and I say, you know, uh, I'm a Samuel in the sense that I can let emotions get in the way, right? You're a Samuel. We surrender to it. We're weak. Our emotions run rampant. We have fears that control and dominate. And we wonder how it's all going to work out. And, and doesn't God tell us, don't worry about tomorrow? <laughs> it's all going to take care of itself. You know, um, I wish I was somebody who hid my emotions better. I wish I was somebody who um, maybe at times interacted differently with people. Uh, but, you know, feelings happen, right? Fear happens, grief happens, every, all sorts of emotions, right? Comes out daily. And, and, and sometimes I wish I was just very robotic so I could get through it. And other times I'm glad maybe I showed my emotion and I said something or I cried or maybe I wish I didn't cry, right? Whatever it is. I know this, I just wish that I wouldn't let my emotions get in the way of what God wants to do with me. And you too. Because I know that you're no different than I am. I look at these couple verses and I say, we can't let the, the emotions get in the way. So who leads Samuel out of the doldrums? God does. The voice that was higher than his own, as one scholar said, 
You know, Samuel's listening to his, all the thoughts and all the emotions. And then God comes along and speaks. A voice that is higher than Samuel's and lifts him up out of the, the doldrums. And you know what he says? Stop having the pity party. Move on with it. Let it go. You know, we, we live in a culture that loves pity parties, don't we? We live in a culture that's touchy-feely. Let me get in touch with my emotions. That's okay to a certain extent. But if, if, but if you don't disconnect at some point, once you address it, once you pick the splinter out, you've got to move on. Or it's going to, you're going to create the rut deeper and deeper and deeper. And so I look at this and I say, uh, hearing the voice of God leads to mental and spiritual renewal for Samuel. It leads to renewed strength and renewed hope. He listened to God. He stopped listening to himself. Now there's a time for self-counsel, but there's a time where self-counsel can really bury you too. I, I, I love what someone wrote about this. The night gives place to the morning dawn. This, this, this picture is one of darkness of the soul. And then yet uh, the Lord, the voice of God upon the soul is like the rising of the sun. Emotional shadows dissipate. Darkness and gloom and doom fade into the sunlight. I'm not a poet, but it's a beautiful picture. And, and God's visitation is exactly what Samuel needed. Amen? There are times, folks, and you don't know this, maybe my wife or kids might say it. There are times where I just sit there as like, I'm, I'm okay with sitting in a dark room at times. You know, just waiting for God to show up. Right? Sometimes I sit there with my coffee. And then when I run out, I want more coffee. Right? <laughs> but, you know, Jerry might come down and say, do you want the curtains open? No. Just sit there, right? I want, I want God to show up. Uh, this is exactly what Samuel needed when he was in a dark place. That's exactly what we need when we're in a dark place, for God to show up. Uh, years ago, I can't remember exactly, but years ago I read an article about, it was a, a guy in ministry, and uh, he had like a pretty, like a big mega church, you know, that's why I guess he was writing the article. But he talked about feelings and emotions, and, and how uh, they're a gauge, you know, like a, you, you read your feelings and emotions, and he talked about that. And I, sometimes I don't know how to read my feelings and my emotions. Sometimes I'm engaged, and other times I'm disengaged, right? But he talked about how they should be a barometer for our engagement to a lot of different things in life. I can tell when I'm engaged, and I can also tell when I'm disengaged. Whether it be from people, life, situations, family, God. You know, and I wouldn't trust my feelings with some things, but I would defer my feelings to other things. Like, I wouldn't trust my feelings with salvation when I'm having a bad day. I trust the Word of God. But I need to trust my feelings when, you know, somebody has sinned. Show compassion. Show a lot of mercy. Don't, don't show judgment, you see. Uh, so God, God engages Samuel to move on. Fill your horn with oil. Go. Be about his business. And, and folks, I, I, look, I was praying for a, a title for the message today. And I was blank. That's why the ladies didn't get anything until Friday morning. I won't send you anything, ladies, and people who run the bulletin. Until I have it, I won't send it. And if I don't have it, then just put generically, there's a message by Pastor Napick. You know, just put that in the Taunton Gazette. I don't really care. But I, I looked at verse 2 and I thought, oh my goodness. That's the word. That's the word for me. That's the word for you today. Fill your horn with oil and go. And that was the title. And that's a wonderful word for every believer. Because, you know, we, we get pulled this way and that way. And God says, no, come back this way. 
And, and they affect our going out and our coming in, don't they? Emotions. I don't feel like sharing God with this person. I don't feel like doing the right thing. I don't want to show this person forgiveness because they were really nasty to me. They said some things that really hurt me that I'll never forget. And, and, and it keeps us from doing the right thing. Uh, of God-given tasks and, and commands, you know? I'm not saying that we shut our emotions down. But I am saying we can't let them get in the way. Uh, there's a time to mourn. There's a time to fill the oil. We're living in a time, folks, where it's time to fill the oil, fill the horn with the oil. You know, uh, very quickly, I, I, I started to, you know, it's, it's interesting. I looked at this. There's a time to mourn and there's a time to fill the horn. It rhymes, doesn't it? <laughs> I started thinking about situations in Scripture where feelings got in the way. Uh, you know, uh, let me entertain you for a minute or two. I'm almost done, right? This is, a, this is an amazing thing that I'm going to talk about. God visited Cain. Why? Because his feelings got in the way. Remember he was angry about the sacrifice? And God told him, move on. If you do well, it'll go well with you. Just move on. And what did he do? He premeditated killing his brother. That's what he did. Feelings got in the way, right? How about the Israelites when they left Egypt? They looked around, their feelings got in the way, they didn't trust God, they didn't trust Moses. They looked back to Egypt, their feelings got in the way, right? God's anger burned against them and he wanted to wipe them out. Korah and his entire family and 250 leaders, they had a problem with Moses' leadership. Their feelings got in the way. The feelings just kind of swallowed them up. And God swallowed them up. Because their feelings got in the way. Aaron and Miriam were taught a hard lesson. You know, they were in leadership with Moses, were they not? And um, they spoke against Moses for marrying a Cushite wife. It's an interesting topic, I suppose. Uh, but he marries a Cushite wife. And they're like, ah, she, you know, back, backbiting and kind of complaining and grumbling, right? And um, God addressed them face to face. He says, you know, why don't Moses, why don't you bring Aaron and Miriam here? And you know the story. She became leprous. leprous and she was put outside the camp for seven days. Her emotions got in the way. Speaking of Aaron, how about when both of his sons died? Remember they offered strange fire before the Lord? Uh, Aaron could have really gotten his emotions in the way, and yet uh, the scripture says he remained silent. Leviticus 10.3, Aaron remained silent when two of his sons died. And then Moses came up to him and said, he said, temper your emotions, don't, don't rip your clothing and grieve publicly. Because your son sinned. Don't make a big show of it. Aaron contained his emotions. Jonah. Good old Jonah. Jonah, I love Jonah. I love the story of Jonah. Uh, you know the story of Jonah. Uh, I took a deep dive, right? I said a little bit earlier, down and down and down and down. That's a picture. You know, he's just sinking down to the bottom. <laughs> he's also emotionally depressed and he's going down. Right? And he takes this deep dive uh, because his emotions got in the way. You, you know, he was more concerned at the end of the book, right? He was more concerned about a gourd than he was the fact that 120,000 Ninevites got saved. Now, folks, if God used you to reach 120,000 people who got saved, what would you do? You, you, you would be like you would be on cloud nine, right? You'd be so excited, you'd be telling everybody, right? And yet Jonah is sitting there, depressed, 
because his gourd dies. He cares about the gourd than he does people. And that's a lesson for showing that emotions can get in the way. How about, how about King Saul? If you, in these chapters afterwards, he made it personal. He couldn't get his emotions out of the way. He would have killed Samuel if Samuel didn't ask God, like, how do I get around this? Because he tried to kill David. Saul couldn't, get, get out of, couldn't let his emotions get out of the way. He made it personal. And yet Jonathan, his son, who could have potentially been in line for the throne, because he, I mean, he did have other brothers. I don't know what, whether Jonathan was first or the middle or, or last. But, but um, Jonathan is a great example of not letting his emotions get in the way. He sides with David. He doesn't side with his dad. He doesn't side with family. He sides with God. God's choice. Uh, didn't Jesus speak of that? Um, he said if we love family, father, mother, son, or daughter more than him, we're not worthy of him. You know, when people do that, they let their emotions get in the way. That's what they do. The emotions, and they can be all over the place, they have to align with God's agenda. Otherwise, we're in trouble. We, we, we run into, into a problem. One final thought. I thought of Christ. He constantly had the right balance, right? He was sensitive, loving, caring, compassionate. He mourned, he wept. But he moved on. Uh, in Luke chapter 19, verses 41 and 44c, I put C there because it, I'm going to just kind of give you a, a broken up quote here. It says, when he approached Jerusalem, he saw the city and wept over it, saying, if only you had known in this day, even you, the things which would make for peace. Oh, Jerusalem, oh, Jerusalem. Because you did not, but now they have been hidden from your eyes because you did not recognize the time of your visitation. You know, folks, um, when God comes to us and we don't recognize that voice, we stay in a bad place. That's what happened with Israel. It didn't happen with Samuel, and I trust it won't happen with us. Let's, let's summarize here. We would do well to learn the importance of emotionally moving on and not letting emotions get in the way uh, of our relationship with God and what he wants. Fill your horns with oil and go. Be Holy Spirit-led. That's the picture here. Get the emotions out of whatever's holding us back. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this wonderful word. Fill your horn with oil and go. And I pray, Heavenly Father, that that would be true for myself and for all the great saints that are in this place today, uh, that we would find great encouragement of heart, uh, great hope, uh, great renewed strength, uh, mentally and spiritually, emotionally, intellectually, that we would be filled uh, with your Spirit and not let our emotions uh, get in the way of what you want to do with us and in your kingdom. Uh, we bless you for this time. We thank you for each heart that's here. We pray in Jesus' name, amen.